Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Florida Church right here in beautiful Florida, Mississippi, in West Madison County, just uh, 14 miles from Jackson, and uh, about the same from Clinton, and about the same from Madison, about 25 miles south of Yazoo City. We're so glad you are joining us today, November the 26th, the year of our Lord, 2023. Can you believe this year is almost over? I didn't think 2020 would ever end. And it ended roughly for a bunch of us, but uh, it did end. And now it's already almost 2024. How about that? Friends, I'm glad you're with us today. Uh, we'll have a uh, just a little Bible study this morning. I'm going to end this season and uh, begin the next season, uh, which is Advent. Advent, the first Sunday of Advent's next Sunday, the first Sunday of December. And... Uh, we're excited about Advent, and we do great things in our church in the Advent season. We hope you're watching today, and uh, you'll watch uh, on into, uh, we're glad you're watching today, I should say, and we hope you'll watch in future presentations. Uh, let me give you a couple of announcements. Tonight, tonight at 6.30, we're going to have a day to honor Israel, to uh, worship Jesus or Yeshua is his, is his Hebrew name. We're going to pray for peace in Jerusalem and we're gonna pray for our Christian brothers and sisters. Some are Palestinian, some are Jews, and some are uh, none of the above. We're just, uh, you know, not a specific uh, type, but there's all, all kinds of uh, Christians over there from Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Protestants, uh, Evangelicals, Charismatics, High Church, Low Church, Mid Church, and they're really suffering and uh, through no fault of their own. This is all on Hamas and on Hezbollah. Hamas is in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank of the Jordan River. The Gaza Strip is on the East Bank of the Mediterranean. So it's hard to sometimes picture those, but but we're going to pray about that, and, and we're going to answer a really important question tonight. And I hope you'll be there. Yeah, just do whatever it takes to get here. We're going to have a great time, and we're going to do the important work of the Lord. And uh, on December uh, the 10th, Sunday morning, December the 10th, at 11 a.m., we're going to have our Christmas musical right here in our church. The choir will be singing that Sunday morning. And uh, then at noon, we're gonna have our Christmas dinner here in our church. We didn't do Thanksgiving, we're gonna do Christmas. And so it is all catered and uh, Pig and the Pint, I believe it's called, has catered it the last two years. We, we have two of the most uh, uh, well-known caterers in all of uh, in all of Mississippi, uh, attend church here. And they do a lot of catering for us, both both do all during the year. But on this occasion, we don't want to ask our church members to work. So we, we don't get our caterers to cater, we get, we get it catered outside of our church, so our church members who cater can come to church and not have to cater. And uh, we have a, a meal plan for oh, I don't know, we'll have 200 people and we'll have our meal plan for 300 people. So we have so much food. So we ask everybody, uh, please come and bring a friend and do not bring a covered dish. Don't bring a pie. Don't, you don't have to bring anything. Just come. And uh, it's all taken care of. It's all paid for. It's all free. And it's all for you. I, I say this tongue-in-cheek, sort of. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I think like a preacher. I hope that doesn't get out. But uh, I tell people tongue in cheek, really, it's a, it's a joke, but it's a fun joke. That uh, if somebody has invited you out during the year and they took you out to eat and you had a great time with them and you've been wanting to return the favor, maybe they had you at their house and you've never gotten around to having them at your house, what you do is you invite them to come to church with you on December the 10th, on Sunday morning, and then you feed them this lovely meal and uh, and then you're even. 
anyway, I hope uh, I hope you'll think through that. And and Christmas is on Sunday this year, or Christmas Eve is on Sunday this year, and so we'll have our Christmas uh, Eve service on Sunday night. And so that day we'll have two services, but the Sunday night service is is carols and candlelight and communion. And we start at six and we're over by about 6.45. And then everybody can be home by seven, just in time to put the kiddos to bed for Santa Claus or do your other Christmas Eve traditions. And so we, we, uh, we love that. Those are big, big, big events in the life of our church. We want you to come. You'll be, there's no sermon. There's, we don't take up an offering or anything like that. We just come together and it's just pure worship. And we come to the table of the Lord and we remember that the, uh, the Christ who was laid in the manger at Christmas is the same Christ who's on the cross at Easter. And our hymnody shares that so well. The, I think of we three kings, that, that uh, Christmas carol is to be sung the Sunday after Christmas. But nevertheless, uh, it really tells the story of the purpose of the baby and why the, why the Magi came uh, from so far to, uh, to worship him and why we need to worship him, his destiny, his destiny and uh, his purpose. His, it's just really incredible. And that's why we shouldn't sing the first, second, and last hymns. I think there are five verses in that one, maybe four or five verses. You ought to sing them all because they all tell the story. Okay, friends, I've got big news. So exciting, so exciting. In uh, on uh, February the 10th, that's on a Saturday, we're going to have our chili for Willie, it's a chili cook-off, and the money goes to support missions in Cuba. And it's a chili cook-off, and we have, I don't know, 20, 30 people enter, and we raise a few thousand dollars. It all 100% goes to Cuba. And the following weekend, the 17th and the 18th of February, Leif Haitland is coming back. It just came up all of a sudden. He contacted us last week and said that... Uh, he has an opening in a schedule. It takes us sometimes two or three years to get on his schedule. And uh, I haven't even approached him about 2024. And uh, just so wonderfully, uh, he said uh, he would like to come and visit us. He's been here twice. And he accepts six or eight invitations a year here in the United States. He is... Uh, uh, an apostle to the Muslim world. He has won more Muslims to Christ well over a million, into the millions, face to face. He's planted 900, more than 900 churches in Pakistan alone. In the Muslim world, they call this Norwegian the ambassador of love. And he really, he really has called and, and uh, he really is uh, you know how people are never quite what you think they are? Well, he is. <laughs> He's exactly what we think he is. He is tremendous. And uh, he'll be here, right here in Florida. And I want you to come. I want you to come. I want you to share this video with folks. And people need to, people need to, people need to come. And, and uh, he flows in the gifts of the Spirit just so freely and so naturally. But uh, he, he moves in the fruit of the Spirit even more powerfully. His, his demeanor and his way of touching people, blessing people is so unbelievable. It, he just puts the enemies of God and the enemies of the kingdom and the enemies of Christ, he puts them at ease and he brings the love of Jesus Christ right in on top of people, disarms them and and it's just wonderful. And I, I remember the first time I met him many, many years ago, and I'd heard him in person a couple of times, and I ran into him in uh, Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky. And he was lost, and he was, I was walking down one hall, he was walking down another. And he stopped me and said, hey, can you tell me where to go? And I said, I can. I, you're here for the conference. I'm attending it. 
And it was just a, just whoo, it was such a blessing. Friends, okay, we're about to segue into Advent. So I want to end this season and Advent is our last season of the, of the year, the Christian year as the first season of, uh, of the Christian calendar, really. It's the, sort of where we celebrate the beginning, the birth of Jesus and Advent means coming. And we celebrate the coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And so early in Advent, our, our minds and our thoughts turn to prophecy. And so before we begin the Advent season, I want to share with you some scripture. We're just going to read the Bible this morning and, and take a look at uh, what uh, we refer to as Messianic Psalms. There's a bunch of them in there. Psalm 118 is very powerful. I think the most powerful Messianic Psalm in the Bible is Psalm 22, and that's the one we're going to read this morning. So I'll give you a moment and grab your Bible, and uh, it's uh, it's not real long, but it's a little bit longer than we normally would read, but I'm going to read the whole thing, and so we'll share with it, and you will immediately, and because, uh, you know, a lot of the prophecies you, you read about the Lord are uh, in the Old Testament are embedded in it, and so you really don't, you got to dig pretty hard and say, okay, I see what he's saying. Isaiah is very, it's mysterious in some ways. And, uh, you know, where, who prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem? Micah, chapter five, verse two. Well, when the wise men came and they asked Herod, of all people, where is he who was born the king of the Jews? Uh, he asked the Jewish scholars and they had to go digging for it. You know, it's embedded in there. And that's the way prophecy is throughout the Old Testament. And a lot of prophecies are like that in the New Testament, certainly in the book of Revelations that way. Uh, but Psalm 22 is not that way. And so it's a great example of, of what we understand to be Messianic prophecies. Now, before we start Advent next Sunday, I'll just remind you that there are about 330 uh prophecies in the Old Testament that anticipate Jesus coming the, when he came the first time. Now there's two advents. There's the first advent where Jesus came as the baby in a manger. And there's the second advent where Jesus is coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's, he's, a, he's a warrior. You will hear the lion of the tribe of Judah roar as I mix metaphors. But <laughs> It is, it's amazing, but there are 330 prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection found in the Old Testament. And some of them, a good many of them, are in the Psalms. Psalm 22 concerns the, the very last of Jesus' uh, life here on earth. They really concern his crucifixion. And when I began to read in, in Psalm 22, verse 1, as I open up the Bible and read that one, that, uh, that first verse, that, will, uh, that first verse will jump off the page at you. You will immediately know that, that you know, we're not cherry picking anything. We're not reading anything into the text. We're not massaging the text to make it fit. Uh, it really is saying exactly what it says. And you will know it instantly. If you have any understanding of the life of Christ here on earth, if you have if you have just even paid, if you only go to church once a year and it's on Easter, you will understand immediately that this is a messianic psalm. So it's a really good example for us to study this morning. And I'll tell you something else about it. There is, a, it's controversial. People argue about it, but the math is just incredible. Uh, but you may be aware of uh, the law of compound probability. That's for people who are smarter than I am, which is everybody. But law of compound probability uh, goes like this. It's uh, if you make a prediction uh, uh, that you have a one in two chance of getting it right, a prediction with one detail. Like if I say it's going to rain tomorrow, you will know it's either going to rain tomorrow or it's not. You got a 50-50 shot at it. You got a one and two shot at it. But if you add just one detail, it's going to rain tomorrow and we're going to get an inch. Get an inch of rain. Well, 
you don't have a one in three shot. You have a one in four shot. Because either it rains or it doesn't. Either it gets, you get an inch or you don't get an inch. So every time you add a detail to the prophecy, uh, it gets uh, just exponentially more uh, 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 more apt to fail. Uh, let's add one detail. It's going to rain tomorrow. It's going to rain in the afternoon, and we're going to get an inch. And so now you got a one in eight probability. It is or it isn't, and you could you could divide that any way you want to. Add another detail. All right, we keep going and add another detail and add another detail. You can see how it how it grows until until it's just mind boggling. And what are the odds? You know, it's into the billions and trillions that. That Jesus would come, there would be 330 prophecies about Jesus first coming, not even counting the second coming. There are 323 verses in the New Testament about his second coming, but there's about 330 prophecies about the, the first coming of Jesus in the Old Testament, written anywhere from, uh, from 4,000 years to 500 years before Jesus. So we would we would say something like this. The, the, the psalm we're going to read today is a, what's a thousand years old. It's a psalm of David, 1,000 years, written 1,000 years before Christ, 3,000 years ago. And he gives detail after detail after detail of, of Christ's last moments on earth. And so what are, the, what are the odds of this happening? Well, they're incalculable, if I said that right. And so... <laughs> And so if people say, I don't see why you Christians believe the Bible's the word of God, I'm like, well, how can it not be? <laughs> I think prophecies given and prophecies fulfilled, uh, that's, the, uh, that's God's fingerprint. So you ready? Let's take a look. This is Psalm 22, a messianic psalm about the last of Jesus' life, the last of his, at his death. And, and as we read this, you will see that David, 1,000 years before Christ, is speaking very, very, very specifically. Okay, let's go to verse 1. Boy, I love this. You know, I've, I've referred you to Psalm 22. I'm in my 19th year here as the pastor of, of uh, my, my charge here, and I've referred you to Psalm 22, I don't know, probably 75 or 100 times. I've never read it to you. And so here we go. You will love this. Verse one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus fulfilled that on the cross, didn't he? Why? I mean, word for word. Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my words, the words of my groaning. These are this is David's words, David's pain, but he's anticipating the Lord's words and the Lord's pain. And he prophesies it exactly. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel and you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted you and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were saved. The righteous cry out to the Lord and are saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Look at this one. But I am a worm. Jesus is saying, David is saying, I feel like a worm. I'm dying a worm's death. Jesus said, I'm hanging on the cross, dying the death of a, of a worm. He said, I'm taking the place of horrible sinners. I'm, I'm bearing on my body what they should be bearing on their bodies. He says, I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. All who see me mock me. You remember that on the cross? They hurled insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Physician, heal thyself. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. How about that? Exactly what the scripture says he went through on the cross. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast for from birth, I was cast upon you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. What do you mean there's no one to help? Well, last 
month on Communion Sunday, we said that uh, Peter denied him and so did all the rest. How about that? There's nobody there. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan. Those are really big. That's the area where the cows grow big. They encircle me. Roaring lions tear their prey against their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Jesus hung on the cross, right? And all his bones, his bones come apart. They break apart. They don't, his bones don't break, but they come loose from their, from their joints. My heart has turned to wax. My heart has melted within me. My strength is dried up like uh, dry pottery and my stung, tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Yes, he, he died for us. Look at verse 16, friends. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men uh, encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. People stare. It means his bones are sticking out of his body. People stare and gloat over me. Did you know that Jesus was crucified at a, uh, in, a, in a garbage dump? where the dogs hung around the cross, the crosses where the Romans crucified people and they lapped up the blood. They waited for pieces of flesh to drop so they could eat it. Did you know that? How about that? Look at verse 18. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Who did that? The soldiers did that. That's exactly what the soldiers, what the Bible says the soldiers did. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. Oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue from the, me from the mouth of lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. And when did this happen? Three days later, up from the grave, he arose. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob and Israelites, honor him, revere him. All you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he will rule over the nations. Friends, that is, uh, that's happening a little more every day. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship and all who go down to the dust who will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Our children will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Who are these people? Who are these people? They're us. It was proclaimed. It was proclaimed from my father to me, from my mother to me, and from me to my children and my children to their grandchildren. Future generations, people yet unborn, for he has done it, meaning he has kept his word. He has kept his word. Oh, my goodness, friends. I'm glad you joined us today for our little Bible study, just a, a few verses found right here in the song, a messianic song, a song that proclaims the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that we have for ourselves and our posterity. Friends, I know that you may think, if you read the newspaper, if you watch CNN, if you watch Fox, if you watch... Uh, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, MSNBC. If you watch any of those, you will, you know 
that it's just bad news. And, and the temptation for us is to believe it. But don't believe it. We have good news. Jesus Christ is risen and Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Now what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna pray for you. The last Thursday was Thanksgiving and I know you had a great time. I, ho I hope you did and I feel like you did. But you know, right ahead of you is Christmas. And every year we read studies you know, Gallup polls or Pew Research studies or Barna polls that remind us that Christmas is the most miserable time of the year for a great many of us. Some of it's just where we are in life, you know. Last year, we sat down at the Christmas table and there were 10 chairs and this year there are nine chairs, that kind of thing. That's hard, isn't it? I don't even like to think about it. I, in fact, I don't think about it. But uh, but it's a reality. Or maybe it's uh, just financial. You know, holy cow! These uh, these crazy Bidenomics, whatever you want to call it, is just we just it's just horrific what inflation has done to has done to us. And everybody is paying so much more for everything. It's not just gas, friends. It's it's uh, people who want a Big Mac, or people who, or people who want a uh, you know uh, to keep their homes heated and cooled during the seasons of the year, and they just can't do it much anymore. People living on fixed incomes. You know, there, there's just some really sad things that happen in our world. I I remember one time. We were driving down. We go to the coast every year, Christmas Day. We're driving down there, and I stop at a gas station in in McGee, McGee, Mississippi. And uh, it's Christmas Day, and uh, the crystal the, the gas station had a crystal hamburgers in it. Crystals, you know, the little the little bitty square hamburgers, and a White Castle for you people that live up north. Crystals down here, and. Uh, it was, uh, you know, getting toward 1030 or so, I guess. And I was gassing up the car and the crystal was open. The gas station was open. The crystal was open. Christmas Day. And there were people lined up waiting to order their, their little hamburger, their little cheeseburger. And our Christmases at, at my childhood to this very day are just, fabulous you know my mother and my sister get out the Linux and uh, they do all of this cooking and we eat on the fine china this once a year you know they break out the stuff and and uh we don't do covered dishes my mother plans a meal and it is just so spectacular and it is every fine food that you can imagine for a holiday meal it is really uh, uh a Norman Rockwell snapshot of American Christmas traditions from the 1950s that just get become refined and carried on through uh, to this very day. And so I went in, you know, to use the restroom, and I stood there for a few minutes. It's many years ago, probably 10, 12, 15 years ago, or something. And and I just stood there for a second and I watched the uh, the people, the little children lined up at Crystal's and I thought, man, that's that's tough. The parents doing the best they could. And some people by themselves alone, staying in those little roadside motels looking for something to eat. Maybe people sleeping in the van or something. I think, Boy, life is hard when you eat at Crystal's on Christmas Day. You don't have the family there to give you the love and the support that you need. It's hard for a lot of people. You know what? <laughs> I don't know what you have in for, store for you this year. Maybe you're going to be at Crystal's. I know that some Christmases we've, you know, had to eat at different places because circumstances took us away. 
And it's just not always just people down on their luck. It's just you have other things going on or somebody's in the hospital or you're having to travel a great distance. And, but still, the crowd of crystals looked like they had seen better days or maybe they were hoping for better days. So there's a lot of reasons, friends, that, that the holiday season is hard on people. I want to pray for you right now. The truth of the gospel transcends every circumstance. I, I want you to know something. I want you to look at me and I want you to share this video with somebody you know. Just, just give me three more minutes. It's a short message today, but here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that today and every day from now to Christmas, I'm going to be praying for you, whatever your circumstance. I don't need to know. People talk about unspoken prayer requests. Does God answer unspoken prayer requests? Lord, I hope so. How many of you know, wave at me, how many of you know the woman with the issue of blood in the Bible had an unspoken prayer request? She tells, she, she says publicly what her prayer request is. They stone her to death. Does God hear the silent cries of our hearts? Things that we would never articulate because they're personal matters. And I would just say to you, friends, yes, he does. He certainly does. Let me pray for you right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, I just thank you, Lord. It's just so precious that people would give us 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Some Sundays would go an hour, some only 30 minutes of their time. Lord, I just thank you so much for this connection we have. And Lord, I, I'm not a media preacher or anything like that. But uh, through the COVID, we have connected with each other and we just ask you, Lord Jesus, Lord, there is no distance in prayer. So we ask you right now, Lord Jesus, to reach through this computer or our television screen, however it my friends are watching this. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would touch and bless and heal and redeem and restore. I pray, Lord, that you would prosper your children. Lord, there are those who are watching right now who are crying out for a job. And I just pray that you would answer that prayer. Lord, there are those right now who need a car. They need a car that runs. Their car continually breaks down. It just is so troublesome. I ask you to bless in Jesus' name. There are those who are watching me right now who are sick. They're sick in their bodies. And, and Lord, there are, uh, there's pain and, and there is insecurity moving forward. And, Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I pray right now, Lord, that you would touch families who have sadness because of death or because of broken relationships or just time and geography has taken us apart. And it's, a, uh, it's, it's fine in normal days, but in the holidays, it becomes grievous unto us. So we pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would bless. Lord, I thank you for 2023 and we're preparing for 2024, but I just pray that we can end this year, Lord, with zeal and with, with, uh, with hope. Lord, I just pray that you would springboard us through the, the rest of November and December and we would just embrace 2024 and uh, we would look at its challenges and its opportunities as, uh, as time, the times and the seasons that will, that will create our testimonies. We'll look back in 2025 on 2024 and we'll say, look what the Lord has done. And we pray not only for ourselves, but our posterity, for our children, our nieces, our nephews, for our neighbors, kids, and for those who, uh, those who are not biological mothers and fathers, but those who are, uh, who are uncles and aunts and neighbors and cousins that, that help us raise our children. And, 
Lord, they're so important. All are so important, Lord. So I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 and amen, amen. Thank you, friends. I'm so, so happy you're watching this. Please share it with somebody. You know, uh, we'll pick up a few views over today, but we'll we'll get more into the future. People go back and watch these things. And so help me, help me get the word out. It's not, I, 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 uh, I teach, I don't preach, and I'm not that good of a teacher. I'm not that good of a preacher. But, uh, but what I'm saying is important. <laughs> and we need to, uh, we need to encourage each other. Amen. We need each other. We need to really provoke each other to hope and to love and to life. So do that for me. Listen, friends, I will see you here next week. It's the first Sunday of Advent, and we're going to go back to our communion passage. Remember that? We're going to, the sort of a disjointed series, the first Sunday of the next, of last, uh, the first Sunday of November, then the first Sunday of December, January, and February. We're going to look for the the uh, the little hidden things in in the communion, and we're going to look at one this next week. And so you'll be sure be sure to tune in, and I will see you there. I love you. I can see you looking at me. I love you. I'll see you here next week. God bless you. Bye bye.